What no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the human heart conceived, what God has prepared for those who love him. Please be seated. Richard Hooker's life and ministry left a legacy, a legacy of wisdom and truth, of sound reasoning and great charity, a legacy of the written word. As we hold his life and work alongside our reading from 1 Corinthians and its apparent skepticism of human wisdom and lofty words, these questions come to mind. Where do wisdom and reason come from? And where do they lead us? Hooker's time, as our colleague describes it, was one of bitter controversy. Born just before the end of Queen Mary's reign, his entire education and ministry took place within the reign of Queen Elizabeth I. More and more, the theological conflict became less between English reformers and Roman Catholics and more between the reformers and those who wished to go on reforming, the Puritans primarily. These Puritans, as described by C.S. Lewis, held a theology which set a God of inscrutable will over against the accursed nature of man with all its arts and sciences, traditions, learning, and merely human virtues. Then there is only one question when looking at human institutions. Is it of God or is it of man? If the former, worship it. If the latter, tear it down. It followed then that the scriptures, the only source of truth, divine truth for the Puritans are over against these merely human ways of knowing. This competitive view of scripture and reason, revelation and nature, God and humanity, simply would not do for Richard Hooker. From his position as a fellow at Oxford, Hooker was appointed the master of the prestigious Temple Church in London and immediately began engaging in passionate public conflict with Puritans, primarily through preaching and primarily with the minister directly below him at the Temple Church, Walter Travers. They had dueling sermons. It was in such sermons that Hooker uttered such unthinkable teachings as, Roman Catholics will probably be saved. (laughs) I know, very unthinkable for his time. Hooker grounds this assertion in a belief that we worship and seek a merciful God ready to make the best of that little which we hold well. That little which we hold well. From the beginning, his approach to theology was grounded in a pastoral awareness of others and of himself. As he further distinguished himself as a cleric of great clarity, capacity, and charity, he was encouraged by friends, family, colleagues to lend his voice to the cause of upholding both the Catholic and Reformed religion. And so he does, composing over the course of several years his first and only book, The Laws of Ecclesiastical Polity, in eight books. In it, he responds to the most serious criticisms and claims of the Puritans, claims that the church should not do or teach anything specifically not found in scripture, and that human reason and wisdom have little if nothing to offer. He does this while also articulating a positive vision for the church and of Christian faith. It is worth mentioning here that Hooker was only able to fulfill his vocation because of the community of support around him. He was supported financially and emotionally by his spouse, Joan, and her family with whom the Hookers lived in London. I'm sure I'm not the only one in the room who can identify with this being supported by your spouse and your loved ones to fulfill your vocation. Amen. We owe as much to Joan as to Richard for the legacy they created. 
Likewise, as one might imagine, publishers of the time did not expect eight volumes of theology to fly off the shelves. <laughs> so Hooker's close friend and colleague Edwin Sandys financed all of the publishing costs up front so that his mind could be shared with the world. It took a village. And now a note for those of us who have from time to time experienced difficulty with Hooker's writing. His characteristic unit, as described by C.S. Lewis, is the long, syntactically Latinized sentence. <laughs> to demonstrate this, Lewis offers his own Hookerian sentence. The Latin syntax is there for use, not ornament. It enables him, as English syntax would not, to keep many ideas, as it were, floating in the air, limiting, enriching, and guiding one another, but not fully affirmed or denied until at last, with the weight of all that thought behind him, he slowly descends to the matured conclusion. This structure mirrors the movement of his mind. This makes his thoughts difficult to turn into quips or sound bites. Again, Lewis writes, indeed, very few of Hooker's beauties can be picked like flowers and taken home. You must enjoy them where they grow, as you enjoy a 20-acre field of ripe wheat. <laughs> so let's enter that field together. Hooker defines law in this way, a directive rule unto goodness of operation. A directive rule unto goodness of operation. A God-given way to achieve a God-given purpose. For Hooker, law is not merely a code or system of human origin to reward good behavior and punish bad. What Hooker is describing is, in fact, the fabric of the cosmos keeping all things in relationship and revealing the mind of the creator at every level. In contemplation of these natural laws, humans have the ability to seek the ultimate source of their desire, God. And all of this is before revelation enters the picture. For Hooker, all humans, by virtue of their creation in the image and likeness of God as the union of intellect and matter, can participate in natural theology. And the very same God that so graciously gave the gifts of memory, reason, and skill to us offers something more, revealed truth, that which we would not have been able to discern on our own, the scriptures. And these scriptures, this revealed truth, do not erase the gifts of reason and wisdom. Reason is the key that unlocks the riches of Scripture, the riches of God's loving, relational self-offering to us. And so, Puritans, we need not strip away all that is not found in Scripture. We need not denigrate the gifts of reason and wisdom and even lofty words, for their true source is God. Where does wisdom come from? from the source of all life-giving law, God. So what does this wisdom point to? Where does it lead us? For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified so that your faith might rest not on human wisdom but on the power of God. For Hooker, all wisdom points to the crucified Christ the God of all creation incarnate in Jesus, whose power redeems us. This wisdom points to the Christ that Hooker experienced in his real human life as a priest, scholar, husband, father, and friend. While Joan Hooker's name does not appear in the laws, her tender love is clear in Hooker's assertion that the kind of love which is the perfectest ground of wedlock is seldom able to yield any reason of itself. In other words, love has a power beyond reason. Likewise, Hooker's writing on grief and sorrow 
was surely shaped by his own experience of loss. While the name of his firstborn Richard, who died mere days after his baptism, does not appear in the text of his writings, Hooker's love and grief live in his words. God will have them that shall walk in the light to feel now and then what it is to sit in the shadow of death. Even Hooker knew what it was to sit in the shadow of death. It is this very shadow of death that for Hooker is transformed by what Paul describes as the power of God. Christ and Christ crucified. All of our wisdom and reason points us to the cross and therefore the altar. Here, where we encounter the power of the crucified Christ's body and blood, here, where we offer ourselves, our souls and bodies, to the God of all creation and source of all wisdom to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice. And it is here, according to Hooker, that the words of our reading from 1 Corinthians are made real for us and for the world. They are things wonderful, which he feeleth, great, which he seeth, and unheard of, which he uttereth, whose soul is possessed of this paschal lamb. What no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the human heart conceived, what God has prepared for those who love him. It is through this sacrifice, once offered, made present to us in this moment, that we show forth what no eye has seen. It is through our union with Christ and one another that we tell the good news that no ear has heard. It is here that we encounter things that the human heart has not conceived. It is here that we receive and become what God has prepared for those who love him. So come and offer yourselves. Bring all of your wisdom, all of your reason, all of your experiences to this altar where we receive infinitely more than we can ask or imagine, where we receive the source of all wisdom and reason made incarnate. And here, become a people possessed by the Paschal Lamb and go to share where, what you have here received. What no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the human heart conceived, what God has prepared for us who love him. Amen.